This week, Vivo announced the international version of their X60 series, including the X60 Pro Plus. And while pricing isn't known yet in the West, it is selling for around 5,099 RMB in China, which is about $920. So I would guesstimate around $1,000 when the prices come in. All the press materials boast about the camera capabilities. So naturally I saw this and the first thing I said to myself is, I need to compare it to a camera, but like a, a camera camera. I mean, a few years back, you would have said that this is an apples to oranges comparison. N not that fruits can't be compared. But you can definitely buy a decent mirrorless for the same price of the Vivo VIX60 Pro Plus, roughly $1,000. Vivo collaborated with Zeiss on the camera systems in this phone. So you get four rear cameras and one selfie camera. With Zeiss in the picture, we have high expectations from this phone and at least on paper, it looks very promising. The main camera is an optically stabilized 50 megapixel camera with a focal length of 35 millimeters at f1.6. There is a wide angle 14 millimeter 48 megapixel gimbal assisted camera at f2.2. Then there are two smaller cameras, a 32 megapixel portrait camera at 46 millimeter and f1.6, and an 8 megapixel periscope camera at 115 millimeters. Consider this a 5x optical zoom lens. The last camera is the selfie camera, and it's a 32 megapixel camera at 24 millimeter with an aperture of f2.4. Since this is such an impressive setup, I thought I'd take it outside and see how it compares with a modern mirrorless camera, the Sony a7 III. To make this a fair fight, we are not going to use any fancy gear, just a standard Zeiss 2470 f4 lens. So Zeiss versus Zeiss, this is fair, right? Now this is in the tech review channel and plenty of people have already dug into the specs of the phone like Technic, which I'll link to here. But I do want to talk about the ergonomics because when you're shooting, it can make a difference. The phone fits nicely to my hands, but may be a bit too big for smaller hands. On the back, you will find the lens array in a rectangular bevel. The good thing about this arrangement is that it's hard to accidentally touch the lens and leave fingerprints. The bad thing is that the phone never lies flat on its back. Well, I don't know how much to really care about this though. Basically, every flagship phone today has a big tushy. As with most phones, you can take picture with the volume buttons, but I found the volume rockers sit too far down to be comfortable for shooting. The placement makes perfect sense as volume rockers, but as shutter button, no, not so much. Okay, with this out of the way, let's head out and test this bad boy. For our first test, I just took some photos in bright daylight settings. I did this at the high-res circa 50 megapixel resolution, which is about twice as much as the Sony a7 III at 24 megapixels. Let's look at the photos. Both the Sony and the Vivo performed really well against the bright background. The colors are vivid and they both hold a nice dynamic range. This is actually quite impressive for a phone. If you look at the top of the tree though, both the Sony and the Vivo display some purple fringing. But with the Sony, this is easily corrected in Lightroom. Looking into the jacket on the left, you can see that it has some more details and a more subtle contrast but this is to be expected from a full frame camera. I am really impressed with the resolving power of the Vivo. When taking a standard photo, you can also opt for Pro Mode, which gives you control over ISO, shutter speed, and white balance. It also enables RAW shooting, but you have to use the full sensor's 3x4 ratio. The file is kept in DNG format, and you can tweak the standard settings in Adobe Photoshop. Sadly though, you cannot take a 50 megapixel RAW. I also wanted to test the camera with some portraits, and this I did in portrait mode, which allows you to use 35 or 23 mm lenses. The portrait mode does have some nice features and impressive eye tracking. You'll even track the closer eye to make sure that the portrait is sharp where it should be. I did use the bokeh mode on some portraits. Now let's compare these apples and oranges. Compared to the Sony, we see that both cameras show a decent bokeh and pretty good on-subject sharpness. But if you unleash the Vivo computerized bokeh, it becomes very impressive. The bokeh looks like actual circular bokeh and not just a blurred background. 
Then comes the periscope camera and you can zoom all the way to 115 millimeters. This is an actual optical zoom with the lens array built vertically into the body of the phone. You see the front element, but the rest of the lenses are tucked away under the back of the phone. The closest we can get with the Sony is 70 millimeters, but cropping the images get us pretty close to the same framing, so let's compare those two portraits. According to Vivo, the lenses are coated with Zeiss Secret Sauce, T-Star coating. Let's compare a photo taking with the Sony and Vivo against some harsh lighting conditions. What can I say? I'm impressed with the Vivo. Even though it does not hold against the Sony, there are clearly more details than I would have expected from a phone. Some of the details are blown out, like the building in the back, but if you look at the reflections on the floor, it actually preserves most of the texture. The highlights bloom more on the Vivo, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you're shooting portraits, it smooths out the skin and has more of a vintage -y feeling to it. Next up is low light. For shooting regular low light images, the Vivo is okay. Not DSLR okay, but it's okay. The magic happens when you shoot cityscapes or stars. Even on a cloudy night, the Vivo outperformed the Sony at f4. It takes a series of images and stacks them together. It accounts for star rotation and even cloud movement to create a pretty impressive photo. It could even find stars that we were not able to see with our naked eyes. Back in the studio, we wanted to compare the phone's macro capabilities with a real macro lens, the Lawa 100 Macro. You can check out that review up top and I'll leave it in the description below as well. I was blown away. This little phone gives a macro lens a run for its money. It gets insanely close and looks awesome. Let's talk about the video. One of the most attractive features about the video here is that the Vivo is capable of shooting 8K videos. While the resolution here is impressive, the quality of 8K is nothing to write home about. It feels more like a marketing gimmick than something you would actually use. I'm not really sure though what situation would demand shooting 8K with your phone. Let's talk slow-mo. The Sony takes the lead here. The Vivo does shoot decently slowed down videos, but there is some form of compression going on and it looks far less impressive than the regular video. This is very noticeable when you compare the slow motion footage to the Sony filming at 100 FPS at 100 megabits. The Vivo is also capable of shooting with the newer H.265 codec, which saves about half the size of the file. Here are two 10 seconds videos with each of the codecs. The Vivo only comes with 128 or 256 gigs of internal memory, so small file sizes do have their advantages. An interesting feature for the Vivo is that it has a built-in gimbal on the wide-angle camera. The Sony, on the other hand, has an internal IBIS. Let's see how the two compare for a short walking video. The stabilization on the Vivo knocks the Sony right out of the park. For the more technical among you, I also compare the rolling shutter effect or the jello effect on both cameras. What can I say? The Vivo is a phone and the Sony has never been known for controlling rolling shutter. Lastly, I wanted to check the video under low light. Here is what you got with the Sony at 1080. When you compare it to the Vivo, well, to be honest, this isn't really a fair comparison. Sony is known for its low light capabilities and we're shooting this at ISO 8000. I would say that the Vivo is okay for sharing with the family, but not really usable beyond that. It's not surprising that the Sony is outperforming the Vivo. It is more expensive and let's be honest, it's a device built specifically for photography. The most surprising thing here is actually that the Vivo is even in the running. We're at a point in time where it actually makes sense to take a phone and a camera and expect the phone to even compete. And the best thing about the Vivo is that it's small enough to fit in your pocket. So that's it. If you like this video, share, like, and subscribe. I'm Udi Kirosh from DIYphotography.net and I'll be seeing you around.